HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 145, recorded live Monday, January 5th, 2009. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. And by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks about the solid principles of object-oriented design with Robert C. Martin. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And uh, we're sitting down today with Uncle Bob, Robert C. Martin, the founder, CEO, and president of Object Mentor Incorporated, but known colloquially to the software community as Uncle Bob. Thank you, sir, for uh, for chatting with me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, one of the things that uh, that I'm hearing talk about a lot in the in the community that I kind of run in the .NET community um, is this the solid principles. These principles that you kind of outlined. In, uh, in in your discussion of the principles of object oriented design, and uh, it's uh, an acronym of acronyms that uh, listed out five kind of basic principles that add up to to solid. And when someone who's maybe not a uh, a software development wonk sits down and looks at these things, it's it's like patterns and more patterns and principles, and it's just it's very kind of it could be looked at as a little academic and I could see where some people's eyes would blur when reading this kind of stuff. So, you know, how do we make this more accessible? How do you demystify the solid, uh, the solid principles? Yeah. I, I, I confess that the names of the principles were something of a conceit. Um, hmm. I, I had, uh, spent a lot of time studying, uh, physics and astronomy. And in those disciplines, you find, principles like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or the Pauli exclusion principle. And so I, I rather liked the idea of three words with the last word being principle. Uh, that was spurred on even more by a book that was written in 1992 by James Copeline, affectionately known as Cope, uh, who, who coined the word the Liskoff substitution principle, which is the third in the solid list. So to demystify them, um, let's take the first one, the, the single responsibility principle. It's a nice word. It, it flows real well, SRP, single responsibility principle. What does it mean? It mm. means that a software module should have one reason to change, uh, and that's what I call a responsibility, a reason to change. Uh, so, for example, take a, um, uh, a uh, payroll application if a, if there's an employee class in that payroll application, uh, you could imagine that it might have methods for calculate pay, uh, or perhaps another method for, um, print a report, perhaps another method in the employee object for save me to the database. And what's unfortunate about these three methods existing in the same class is that they all have three completely different reasons to change. Mm-hmm. The, the payroll will, ch- the calculate pay will change, uh, if the accountants decide on a new way of calculating pay. The report generator will change if, uh, the people who consume the reports want the format of the report to change. Uh, mm-hmm. the, um, the save function will change if the DBAs decide that we need to change the database schema. That means that this one class has three different reasons to change. And there are probably many other classes that depend upon it. Mm -hmm. And so as it changes, those depending classes also suffer through change. Uh, They'll be affected or impacted by those changes. Single responsibility principle simply says find one reason to change and take everything else out of the class so that you separate the things that change for different reasons. You group together the things that change for the same reasons. Mm-hmm. This is somewhat out of um, out of the norm for object oriented design. Early object oriented design principles uh, had us grouping together functions that operated on the same data structures, so that the methods of a class would all manipulate the same variables of that class. But if those methods change for different reasons, 
Yeah, yeah. Then they really belong in separate classes. That's That definitely flips things on its head, because I remember when I got into C++, I was moving from C, and we were already trying to write what we called object-oriented C, you know, having an associated group of static methods act on a structure that was a C structure, and we lied to ourselves and said it was OO. And then moving that to C++, we would take, you know, book objects and people objects and then give them all sorts of bits of functionality. This almost inverts that whole that whole concept. Well, it does. In fact, it drives it somewhat closer to the to the thing that you were kidding yourself about. Because in C, you could take a list of uh, uh, a data structure in a .h file, and then you could take a list of functions that manipulated it and put that in the one .c file. But mm -hmm. you could take another list of functions that still manipulated it and put it in another .c file. Separate them so that. You could, in, in that case, have uh, functions that did reports, functions that did uh, database manipulation, functions that did uh, calculations, manipulating the same data structure but in completely separate .o files. And that would allow you to separate them into different DLLs nowadays, which probably couldn't do back then, uh, mm -hmm. and, and deploy them independently, which is one of the main goals here. Now... One of the things that I was taught in school was that naming your objects was very, very important. And my particular instructor just pounded that into my head, that if you can't name it and feel good about the name and feel that the name says what it is, then you need a better name. It seems like the single responsibility principle would cause a, an explosion of classes, and I would suddenly be faced with difficult naming decisions. Like, what exactly is this now that now that it's not the object that I expected it was going to be? Yes, and, and in fact, the exact opposite is true. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the more smaller objects you have, the more focused they are, and the, more easy, the easier it is to think up of a name for them. We get into naming dilemmas when we have an object that does so much that it's impossible to name it except to give it some broad brush name like employee manager. But if you separate out a bunch of very small objects, it's very simple to come up with names if they're focused. So you could have the uh, the employee report generator and the employee database saver and the employee uh, payroll calculator, uh, and those names are very specific to what those classes do. So the if we're grouping things based on their reason to change, which isn't quite data and it isn't quite methods, it's more it's more their domain, it's more the space that they work within. What are the names that I'm, I mean, traditional object-oriented design, kind of the way that I was taught, pushes us into these manager objects, master objects, service objects, these generic terms that, that mean uh, I know too much. What kinds of names of objects am I going to end up with when I'm applying the single responsibility principle appropriately? Well, you'll, you'll wind up with longer names, generally, but very mm -hmm. focused. Uh, so you'll create a class, and that class will do one thing. Uh, for example, the class that saves the employee to the database. Uh, you might call this the employee gateway, uh, using Martin Fowler's gateway pattern. Or you might call it the, um, the employee uh, DB, bad name, but some people like to put DB at the end of their database controllers. Whatever convention you use, it becomes clear that this class relates employees to the database and does not do calculations and does not do report generations. Mm. Uh, if you had a, um, a class that uh, put an employee record up on the screen, um, perhaps in HTML, you might call this the employee HTML renderer or something like that. Very precise names for many small classes, as opposed to uh, very generic names for a few large classes. And by the way, this, this um, practice goes right down to the function level as well. We want mm -hmm. to have lots of little functions, not, not few big functions. And by little, I mean you know, five, six, seven lines long. Functions should, be, should follow the same rule as the single responsibility principle. And that applies to methods, too, you're saying? So a, a class yeah. should have only one reason, and a method should have only one reason to change. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, a method should be extremely focused. Uh, if it's got an if statement in it, it probably shouldn't have two or three. 
if it's got a Y loop in it, it probably shouldn't have two or three. And mm. Very, very small, focused methods. Yeah. And what you get with that is a, it becomes very easy to name them because you can choose very long names because they're only called once. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those names can be extremely, extremely informative. And then you wind up with lots of little bits of code underneath well-named functions. Um, I call this uh, cleaning up the room. Uh, remember when you were a teenager or, or younger, uh, your filing system in your room was to dump everything on the floor. And you knew where everything was, and it was fine, and, and your clothes would be on the floor, and your toys and your books and whatever, they'd be on the floor. You knew where it all was, but your mother yeah. would come in and say, no, you've got to clean up this room. It's much and like eventually, my out of desktop. frustration, she would clean it for you, and she would taught you, put things mm-hmm. in certain places, know where they go. And maybe if she was of the old school, she recited that old, old saw, a, a place for everything and everything in its place. That's the same kind of thing we get with the single responsibility principle. We divide things up into small little bits. We name the places that they go with extremely informative names so that our code, our entire system, follows the rule, a place for everything and everything in its place. Wow. How how long is this going to – if I go and apply this today and start thinking about this, how draconian should I be about – about these kind of things, how ruthless should I be when I make these decisions? I I think it would apply a very different feel. It would make my it would make my programming day feel different, uh, for lack of a better way oh, to yes. phrase that. Oh yes, uh, it probably would make your programming day feel different uh, because what you're doing is is imposing a great deal of structure on something that otherwise would have been somewhat amorphous. Uh, imagine a function that is 50 lines long and the left edge looks like the side of a cross-cut saw. It's deeply <laughs> indented and it goes yeah. in and out and finding your way around in there is fairly difficult. Mm-hmm. And then ch- remove chunks of that. Split it up into 10 functions, five lines long. Each one has one level of indent. And name each one of them. And you wind up with a structure that is readable. Uh, and understandable, and you don't have to dig your way deep inside the sixth or seventh indent to figure out what's going on. You can read the name of the function above it and say, oh, that's what's happening here. Uh, that's a much more powerful way of working. Some people get afraid that, um, oh, that's going to proliferate all the functions like crazy. I'm going to have too many functions and too many classes, and I'm going mm-hmm. to get lost in a sea of classes and, and functions. And actually, the opposite is true. If you don't do this, you are already lost in a sea of heavily indented code that has no names and no structures. Once you put the name and the structure upon it, it becomes a lot easier to find your way around. Okay. All right. So that's the S in solid then. So then the 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 O is... Yeah, we got through one. (laughs) We got through one, but this is good though because this is this is important because I think that this is the closest thing to commandments... And I don't mean commandments in the sense that, you know, Uncle Bob and family went up on high and came down with this information, but this is uh, guiding principles that are good basic stuff that aren't really arguable. I mean, you know, thou shalt not steal is pretty unambiguous. Uh, and you could always find reasons to – there's always exceptions, right? You know, I'm sure that there are sure. reasons to make an, uh, a multiple multiple responsibility class. But then you can certainly debate that until the cows come home. Sure, you can think of these as engineering principles as opposed to yeah, commandments. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So the O, open close principle. Yes, this is a principle that was coined in 1988, I believe, by Bertrand Meyer, uh, and in in a wonderful book, uh, Object Oriented Software Construction, which was uh, one of the early terrific books on object-oriented design. This principle states what sounds like an oxymoron, sounds like a contradiction in terms. Uh, It says that modules should be open for extension but closed for modification. Uh, and, And that means that you should be able to change what a module does. You should be able to extend its behavior without modifying any code in the module, whatever. Imagine that you have a module and you've set the read-only bit. You're not Mm -hmm. allowed to change it, and yet you can still modify what this module does by using some other mechanism, and that's what the open-close principle is all about. 
Uh, and the, obviously, the mechanism we use is polymorphism. We create uh, abstract interfaces so that we can have the module that we want closed calling an abstract interface, and then we can extend what that module does by creating derivatives of the abstract interface. Mm -hmm. The benefit here is that it allows us to create systems whose behavior can be extended without modifying the core of the code. We can add new features by adding new code, not by changing old existing code. And that has obvious benefits. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you could, if you could add a whole new suite of features and never touch the core of the code, just add new code, you would not break the core of, that, the, core of the code. You wouldn't be putting it in any kind of risk. So the open-close principle is a, a principle of attitude. We want you to think about how you can separate the behaviors of the system so that you can keep those behaviors that are utterly intrinsic mm -hmm. behind a wall that, that can't be touched. And then all of the behaviors that are variable and transient and change a lot, you put on the other side of the wall, and you allow them to change as frequently as you want. And you make sure that all of the dependencies that cross that boundary point inwards towards the code that can't be changed. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the inheritance relationship is that it points at the base class, and the base class changes less frequently than the derivatives. And so we try to apply that with object-oriented techniques using the open-close principle to create this two-sided structure. On one side, you have all the base classes uh, where nothing changes, and on the right side you have all the derivatives where things are very, very volatile, and all the dependencies point towards the base class. Hi, this is Scott, coming at you from another place in time. Are you looking for an object relational mapping tool for mission-critical projects using Link and .NET? I wanted to share with you Genome. It's so specifically designed for developing .NET Enterprise applications. Genome is a mature link-integrated ORM tool. It's been employed in numerous large-scale projects over the last six years. Genome was created for the .NET platform as opposed to being a port from Java. And it's thrived on platform innovation since .NET 1.0. Genome has supported Link since its CTP release in May of 2006. It offers several unique features, such as encapsulation and reuse of link queries and expressions. You can really fully harness the power of Link while benefiting from your database platform's unique features. Compose complex link queries, decompose the query logic in your domain model. Link supports all the major database platforms you find in enterprise environments like SQL Server, but also Oracle and IBM DB2. You can find out more about how Genome integrates tightly with Visual Studio and what tools Genome offers to reduce development time at tinyurl.com slash trygenome, G-E-N-O-M-E, where you can also download a free and fully functional trial version. I hope you enjoy it. Now, these principles don't dictate language, but they do kind of, there's an, I mean, it, it, fe it feels like, I just think, you know, traditional object-oriented languages. Do we use traditional, I mean, do, is this a polymorphism principle, or can we do strategy patterns and have different, you know, pluggable interfaces to achieve the open-closed principle? Or does this dictate mark your methods virtual? You can, you can do this with, uh, standard virtual methods in uh, mm -hmm. C Sharp or in, in Java or C++. Or uh, if you wanted to, you could use pointers to functions in C. Or you could use cleverly crafted switch statements in Fortran <laughs> or in go computed go-tos. In okay. Or, so the or principle uh, is the in other thing. languages, there are many, many ways to achieve this. Uh, even the, um, the template uh, language of C++ and to a lesser extent Java give you some capabilities for doing this. The, the basic mm -hmm. idea is, is very simple. Uh, you keep the things that, ch that, that change frequently away mm -hmm. from the things that don't change. And then make sure that if they depend on each other, the things that change frequently depend on the things that don't change frequently. Okay. That's so, really the open-close principle. And you can do that with polymorphism. You can do it with mm -hmm. textual substitution. There's a whole bunch of ways to do that. So the open close principle kind of segues very neatly into the, the the crazily named or the interestingly named Liskov substitution principle. That's the one that you'll make you sound extra smart if you throw it around the office. Yes, right. Uh, 
that that was the one I liked because it sounded so much like the Pauli exclusion principle. <laughs> yeah, you you can't help but sound intelligent saying these things uh, uh, around the water cooler. Liskoff substitution principle. Yes. Yeah. Very erudite. Now, does this one? Uh, this seems to be a little closer to um, this principle. It seems to expect virtual, you know, virtual methods to work a certain way. It seems to expect a language to work a certain way more than the other, the the previous two principles we've covered so far. Uh, It it certainly has a very strong connection to uh, inheritance and virtual functions, although it, it applies in languages like Ruby or Python, which don't have uh, traditional inheritance of that nature. The, mm-hmm. I, the idea behind this principle is, is pretty simple, although the implications are very far-reaching. Uh, if you have a, an expectation of some object or some entity, and there are several possible sub-entities, we'll call them subtypes, mm-hmm. that could implement that original entity, uh, the caller of the original entity should not be surprised by anything that happens if if one of the sub-entities is substituted. So a simple way to think about this is that if you're used to driving a Chevrolet, you shouldn't be too surprised uh, when you get into a Volkswagen. You should still be able to drive it. Uh, that's the basic idea. There's uh, an interface. You can use that interface. Lots of things implement that interface one way or another, and none of them should surprise you. Now, the uh, the... the the canonical example is the um, uh, the rectangle square problem, and it, this is a, a huge philosophical debate. It goes on all the time uh, mm-hmm. in OO circles, or at least it used to. I think it's pretty well resolved now. But given a a rectangle base class, and given a the need for a square, should the square class derive from the rectangle? And the, the, at first blush, this seems like it's obvious. Of course, the square should derive from the rectangle. A square is a rectangle. And the word mm-hmm. is a becomes very is a, important exactly. here. Well, well, square is a rectangle. Well, then you face some interesting dilemmas. Once you create that relationship, then, then you start to ask yourself some funny questions. Like, well, wait a minute. How many variables does a rectangle have? Well, it's got two, height and width. Uh, how many variables does a square need? It only needs one. Well, how many is it going to inherit? It's going to inherit two. Well, there's something wrong there. It's getting too many variables from the base class. There's a, a dilemma here, and it sounds right. Rick. Square should derive from rectangle, but if it does, it's going to be wasteful of memory. Now, memory is cheap, so maybe we ignore that. Okay. There are methods inside of rectangle, methods like set height and set width. And when we derive square from rectangle, we're going to inherit those methods. What does set height mean? on a square. And how is it different from the other method that's inherited by a square, which is set width? There's a a naming problem, and the user of square is going to be faced with these names, set height and set width. They don't make any sense on a square. Now, we can make them work by causing the the set height function to also set the width and uh, to cause the set width function to also set the height. But the names are still messed up. There's something wrong. And then we force the failure. There is a failure mode that can occur here. And the failure mode is very simple. Uh, you've got some guy up there, who, some class, who uses rectangles. And the programmer of this class has made an assumption. When you change the height of a rectangle, the width never changes. Perfectly reasonable assumption if you're dealing with a rectangle. Mm. But now, because I have derived square from rectangle, I can pass him a square... He's going to call set width, and the height is going to change out from underneath him. And because he didn't expect that, he'll have some if statement that blows up. He'll corrupt the heap, and a billion instructions later, the whole system will crash. And he'll get his logic analyzers out, and he'll debug this thing for two weeks, and eventually he'll find out that, oh, my God, somebody passed me a square, and I was expecting a rectangle. And as a result of that, he will put an if statement in his code, and the if statement will read, if this rectangle is really an instance of square. Mm -hmm. And as he's done that, he has hung a dependency on the derivative of rectangle. He he has mentioned the name of square, and that... That uh, that dependency right. violates the open-close principle. 
So you wind up with if statements scattered around your code because of these these violations of the uh, the substitution principle that you couldn't even see at first. And those if statements hang dependencies on nasty nasty derivatives that then violate the open close prim- principle, makes it very difficult for you to modify uh, mm-hmm. square uh, without changing all of these things that now depend on rectangle. So that's that makes sense, but let me push, what would you do? I mean, this is a, you know, pick a side. What would I do with the, with the square rectangle problem? Yeah. They're not related at all. Squares and rectangles uh, aren't related in, in the code. Uh, a square in geometry is related to a rectangle in geometry. But these uh-huh. two pieces of code are not pieces of geometry. They're pieces of code. They have completely separate behavior. So I wouldn't have any relationship between them at all. Or at most, perhaps, they would have a common parent, which might be shape. You know, yeah, that's interesting. In the, when, you, when you first said, is a, of course, the, the object-oriented light went on, but then later on you said, is related to. Mm. It, it, I think it's, it's comforting sometimes to try to make, as, as we as programmers try to make order out of chaos, to go and say, Oh, a cat is a mammal, is an animal. This is a nice, clean hierarchy. Let's go and start naming things. Sure. And, and we try to sure. simulate these hierarchies when, uh, you know, maybe maybe a cat is different. You know, suspend disbelief. It's not a mammal. Let's, it's something else. The, the word is a crept into our vocabulary. And by the way, that's, that's one word, ISA. Uh, <laughs> it crept into our vocabulary through a circuitous route and became very important in object-oriented circles, but it didn't start out that way. It crept in in the, uh, the 80s through the AI crowd, uh, who had created these wonderful knowledge nets. You might remember this, uh, all the hype about artificial intelligence in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, mm-hmm. And they had created these structures that would walk knowledge nets, these inference engines. And the relationships between the entities and the knowledge nets were things like uh, uh, is like, uh, tastes like, uh, smells like, uh, looks like, uh, is uh, all of these uh, dash A uh, relationships is uh, like, uh, has a. Uh. And when the AI crowd lost its funding and all this funding dried up, they kind of looked over and said, oh, there's this OO stuff. It's kind of cool. And look, there's these relationships like has uh, and is uh, they're real similar. We ought to just uh, move in. And they kind of did. And, and the vocabulary transitioned over. That's interesting. It's also a little unfortunate because inheritance is not is a. Uh, in, inheritance, if you look at it with a very jaded eye, inheritance is the declaration of methods and variables in a subscope. and has nothing to do with is a, whatever. And the, the notion of is a can be very confounding. Uh, simple example. A, uh, an integer is a real number, and a real number is a complex number. You could draw that in UML. It would be very simple with all the inheritance arrows and so forth. But think about trying to compile it. Uh, an integer, we would hope, would be 16 or maybe 64 bits. But if it were to derive from a real number, a real number has two integers in it, a, 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 a mantis and a characteristic, uh, the exponent. And they, use, they, they imply binary points inside them to make the floating point number. Uh, the floating point number, the real number, derives from complex. But a complex has two real numbers in it, the imaginary and the real part. If you were to think about writing that in, in C++ or in Java, you'd, you would write a structure that could not be compiled because it has infinite size. Makes perfect sense in English, makes no sense at all in software. <laughs> Which it seems to be most of the things that I work on. It, it, it all seems so clean, and, and, and then you start trying to model it. It makes me think about those, these, these, these new modeling languages that people are coming out with to you know, model everything. Oh, to yeah. try to teach, you know, what do you think? What do you think about those grand designs to, to, to model? You know, all we need is a new modeling language, and then it'll be okay. Yes, we, it's, we've always been on the hunt for a new modeling language. We always will be, uh, and that's a fine <laughs> thing. I think you know, we we want to continue to hunt for the grand unifying language. There is no such thing, obviously. Uh, yeah. There's a, a you've heard about the the uh, MDA people, the model driven architecture folks. I think this is a great effort. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I wish them a lot of luck. I have no confidence whatever that they're going to find a way to create a modeling language that um, is so good that 
you won't need programmers anymore. Programming is the uh, is the the profession of managing detail, detail in information systems, and there's no way to get rid of all that detail. Any any modeling language is going to have to be able to deal with nasty, icky, rotten, lousy detail, and it's programmers who drive the language to do that kind of mastery. So if it's you know a language that uses UML or a language that uses some other wonderful graphic tool or or a language of some other kind, it's still going to be dominated by massive amounts of detail and require programmers to, to manage it. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, someone will do a switch statement, and then they'll spackle over it and pretend it didn't happen, and then it becomes legacy code. Well, yeah. Le- <laughs> have you read Feather's book on legacy code? I, I have. And actually, uh, Carl Franklin had him on .NET Rocks, uh, I think, at Ordev. Oh, good. Yes, at Ordev. Uh, and Michael's um, Michael's definition of legacy code is code that's not under test. If you don't have exactly. test for it, it's already legacy code. Yeah, and it's interesting going back uh, and finding code that I wrote not ten years ago, which had no tests, but five years ago, which did have you know piles of n unit tests. The only thing uh, that I feel when I see my old legacy code is well, not legacy code, but my older code is, gosh, I should have written more tests. That's the yeah, well. The, <laughs> The one thing I keep coming back to, like, oh, wow, there's tests. That's great. Test.bat. Oh, there's not enough tests. That's, that's, I continually uh, have that feeling. This is something that the community owes a great debt to uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham for. See, oh, the yeah. whole, whole notion of test-driven development and the, the drive towards uh, massive amounts of unit testing and acceptance testing. And it makes a huge difference, just an enormous difference in the, the quality of code and the ability to get into code and manipulate it and change it. When you have tests, you're not afraid. If you've got a big wad of code out there and there's no tests, you're scared to death to touch it. Because you know you're going to break eight things in there. But if you have tests, you can reach into it and fiddle with it and pull on it and push at it and tweak it. Run mm-hmm. the tests on, they all still pass. I didn't break anything. Great. As long as those tests have enough coverage. You know, there was an interesting discussion I got into with some people about dynamic languages versus statically typed languages, and the individual said that the compiler was just a unit test. <laughs> once, you ex- once you accepted the fact that the compiler was just a unit test, then the, the, the whole argument of dynamically typed versus statically typed didn't matter anymore. <laughs> The, uh, the argument of static versus dynamic is an interesting one because the static typing creates a set of, of very rigid dependencies that tends to make the code ri- uh, inflexible. And it's, it's really hard to segregate your code into a nice set of flexible modules. Whereas with dynamic languages, it's really easy to keep the code as flexible as you want, and it's also really easy to make a horrid mess. Mm-hmm. So you wind up with this this double edged sword. Which one would you like? Would you like to be, uh, you know, highly disciplined and ordered, but you have to live within a rigid framework, or do you want to be a little bit lackadaisical and you know, and do some nice uh, flexible things? And I, I my uh, my preference of late is towards the dynamic language. I've gotten very uh, pleased with languages like Ruby. I enjoy them a great deal. I maintain my discipline by writing gobs and gobs of tests, uh, although I probably still write much more Java than Ruby. Mm-hmm. Well, let's pound through the last two uh, principles here as we get oh. to the end of the show here. We've still got to talk about dependency inversion and interface segregation. If we do it in order on your article, it's S-O-L-D-I. If we yes. spell out solid, though, why, and is that, why is it not spell out solid? You actually never say solid in your article. Uh, no, the, the word solid actually came up later. Michael Feathers wrote me a quick email saying, you know, if you reorder these, it spells the word solid. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> saldy didn't, yeah, didn't quite roll off the tongue. No, but I wasn't looking for an acronym. He just found it for me, and then we've since found some pictures. <laughs> so if we do it in order, the, the, um, if we do it in the original order, then the next one is the dependency inversion principle. And, and, right. This is a um, almost a restatement of the open closed principle, except from a, a ninety degree rotation. Uh, the open closed principle states the goal: you know, make things so that they, you don't have to modify them and you can extend their behavior. 
the dependency inversion principle says, don't depend on anything concrete. Depend only on things that are abstract. Now, if you think about that, those two are, are roughly the same. The open-closed principle is achieved by having derivatives depending on base classes uh, and making sure that all of your volatile code is in the derivatives and your, your non-volatile code is in the base classes. Dependency inversion principle just says that the opposite way around. It says, okay, make sure that all your dependencies point at things that are abstract. The dependency inversion principle goes to a, a pretty far uh, extreme. It, it goes on to say, uh, don't depend on anything concrete, ever. Uh, if you're calling a function, it should be an abstract function, a pure function. Uh, if you're overriding a function, uh, make sure it's pure. Uh, if you're, if you're a cre uh, calling an, uh, an object or you're holding a reference to an object, make sure it's a reference to an abstract base class of the object. Uh, never touch anything concrete. Obviously, you can't you can't do that, right? There's yeah, I mean that's pretty. That's like I say, I keep, keep saying draconian, but I mean sometimes people take the solid principles and they wield them with a like a stick. You uh, know? Well, I mean, yeah, then that'd be silly. You you have to do it again. They're engineering principles, right? I mean it's it's, it's an interesting thing that I mean the, you work with with groups and you go in and consult with groups, but you know when you're a member of one of these groups and someone comes in and drops some principles on you that maybe you're unfamiliar with. And then, and then leaves, uh, the people who drank the deepest of the Kool-Aid then start to have, have these principles. You know, they basically, they, hey, thou, thou shalt not kill. Hey, now, remember the commandments at every, at every turn. Uh, at, at how much, you know, how many grains of salt should we use when we're applying these, these principles? How important are these? Are they, is one more important than another or are they all equally? No, I think they're all very important. Although if I had to pick one to, um, if I had to pick an order, I'd probably say single responsibility, dependency inversion, open close, list off interface. Okay. That was just, that was completely off the top, but okay. Sure. Uh, dependency inversion is, is very mechanistic. It says you know make sure you depend only in the direction of of um, abstraction. Uh, there are certain parts of the code that must violate that, but then I have a rule about those certain parts that must violate it. They belong on the on the right side. Mm -hmm. So remember, we had this when we talked about the open close principle. We had these two sides: the the volatile side and the uh, the non volatile side. And the uh, the uh, the things that violate the dependency inversion principle all belong on the volatile side. The things that change frequently. Anything that we don't want to change, anything that's part of the core abstraction of our system, we furiously defend the dependency inversion principle. Uh, I, I call the other side the side related to main, the volatile part. That's the side related to main. Main is the most concrete of our functions, and it will, it will create all of our instances and all of the factories and all of the concrete classes for us, and it will then hand off to the to the abstract part, a set of abstract pointers to abstract in, in the interfaces. Mm -hmm. And the abstract core will manipulate it as though it were in this fantasy world where everything was abstract. That boundary line that I draw between the volatile and the non-volatile um, actually repeats itself several times in every system, so you'll find lots of those uh, boundary lines all through. And on the one side, you've got flagrant violations of dependency inversion because somebody's got to create these objects. And then on the other side, you've got, you know, really strong defense of the dependency inversion principle. Yeah, I mean, at some point you have to draw the line. I mean, the, 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 fra yes, the framework exactly. itself that Literally. does the newing has to break some principles. And so we make sure that those go on into a certain place. You don't right. new things uh, in the n normal part of the code. You call mm -hmm. new inside of factories or inside of prototype methods or somewhere that's related to the volatile part of the system. We don't want to see any news in the non-volatile part of the system. That, that's, a good, that's a very good way to phrase it. That, that makes a lot of sense. So then hmm. the uh, your self-described least important or least important amongst peers here, the interface segregation principle. Yes. This is a... Um, it applies to uh, very fat classes, classes that have uh, hundreds of methods and uh, many, many clients. And you get into a situation where you'll have populations of the clients that use 
subsets of the methods of this class. So to make this simple, let's say you've got a big class, call it FAT, and it's got a bunch of methods in it. Um, and there's a, a group of clients over here that calls the first three methods and another group of clients over here that calls the last three methods. Uh, now imagine that one in the one of the first three methods changes its signature for some reason. Uh, we've got to add an argument to it. Okay. The population of clients that does not care about that method is still forced to be uh, to change because right. the class itself changed. This was really important in C plus plus where a pound include was involved, and the pound mm-hmm. include caused a recompile of of everybody that that uh, depended on it. It's it's also important in Java and C Sharp, although not quite as important. Uh, some people play a funny game where they, they change the signature of a method and then the other files that don't care about it, uh, they just don't bother to recompile them. Uh, we found everybody who did that and took them out and back. Mm-hmm. In general, you want to be able to, if, if a source file changes, you have to recompile everybody who depends on that source file, even if nothing they really cared about changed. Now, the way we can avoid that from happening is by taking each of the uh, each of the the clients and creating an interface that contains only the methods that they care about. Now if we had a if we had 10 clients then we'd create 10 interfaces. And each of those interfaces would have a different set of methods in it and all the methods in there would be abstract. And then the fat class would inherit from all 10 of the interfaces. And if there were duplications in the methods they would just be Hmm. grouped together but through that interface. And once you've done that, then no no class depends on any more methods than it ever needs. It simply depends only on the methods that it needs, and if uh, a change happens, it changes to the interface. The clients of that interface obviously have to be recompiled, but nobody else does. And so all the other clients are safe. There's an, there's an elegant pragmatism to that. Uh, I don't usually think of being... For some reason, I always feel like when I say pragmatic... When I'm doing something, I say, oh, I have to make a pragmatic decision. I always feel like that's a difficult decision or the wrong decision, and I just apply the word pragmatic to make myself feel better about it. Ah, but, uh, okay. Well, for something to be both elegant and pragmatic feels really, really good. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Well, in general, you don't want to depend upon something you don't use. Mm-hmm. Right? And and here you got a class with a whole bunch of methods in it, and you don't call most of right. them. No, it and seems yet, it seems obvious. By but... hanging a dependency on them, you're depending on those methods. So. The, the number of interfaces, the sheer number of interfaces, the, the specialization, uh, applying the single responsibility principle, just not just to classes, but also to, to methods and to interfaces, will definitely cause a, a, pro, a, a relative proliferation of, of, uh, of new things within, you know, new, new, new interfaces, new methods, new classes. Um, but like you said, they'll each be very specialized and basic and simple. There'll be more of them, but they will be specialized. That's certainly true, especially in languages like like C sharp and Java and C plus plus. Right, which is now think of a language like Ruby. In a language like Ruby, uh, you never depend on anything more than the method you're calling. The methods declared in a class are not part of what you depend upon when you when Mm -hmm. you send a message to an object. In fact, when you send a message to an object, you don't know what class it is. Mm -hmm. And so, Mm -hmm. dynamic languages automatically obey the interface segregation principle and obey it in the most extreme way possible. There is no way for them to depend on any more than the methods that they actually call. Well, that is an excellent uh, way to end our discussion of the uh, the solid principles, our demystification. Uh, Uncle Bob, I really appreciate you taking as much time as you did to sit down and chat with me about these principles. And folks can can learn about them at uh, at objectmentor.com. You can poke around on the site there. There's also blog.objectmentor.com. And if you go up there, you can see that Uncle Bob, as well as uh, his cohorts, Dean, Brett, Michael, and Bob, are all on Twitter. Uh, so you can drink in as much of the uh, the wit and wisdom of Uncle Bob as you can possibly take in one sitting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, thanks so much for your for your your work in the last many many years. You've been in the business so long, and we look to you and your cohorts uh, with a lot of respect. And we really appreciate uh, everything that you offer to the community. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and this, this has been a lot of fun. So maybe we'll do it again sometime. All right.
Well, this has been another episode of Handsome Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.